to start off this talk by asking everybody to take a minute to pay attention to something that we're always doing but rarely paying attention to, our breath. Close your eyes if you dare, trying not to check that everybody else is doing it around you. And try to focus on the sensation of the air coming in past your nostrils as you breathe in and follow where it's going. Don't worry about what you're thinking. Try to just isolate that sensation of feeling. Now, taking a step away from ourselves, take a second to think about how, as you're breathing, so is everyone else in this room. Beyond these walls, are the trees and plants producing the oxygen that you are breathing. And those trees and plants are inhaling the carbon dioxide that you exhale. And now take a second to think about what that brings to mind for you. And then you can open your eyes. Like a lot of people, I think, I spend a lot of my time thinking about what the purpose of my life is. What does it mean to actually live? How does my tiny speck of a self have any effect at all on the universe? The conclusion that I've come to so far, and I'm still working on fully grasping, is that I don't think that I alone will have a tangible, concrete effect on the world, because that would imply a singularity of existence that I don't think is possible. Rather, I think the best way for me to find meaning in my life is to be aware of it as it's happening, to contribute to the causes and effects manifesting within and around me with good intentions, to live my life on purpose. Right now, I'm a medical student. About four years ago, I found myself in Thailand, and having spent the vast majority of my budget on the plane tickets, the activity that I could afford was studying Buddhism and meditation under the tutelage of two English-speaking monks at a monastery for 10 days. And the experience brought me in touch with something I hadn't realized I was missing, but had always been right there in my breath. When I came home from Thailand, I continued studying Buddhism and meditating, working on integrating those mindfulness practices within a Western culture and within my life of studying, conducting research, rowing competitively, and while still trying to maintain an ability to relate to my friends and family who weren't Buddhist and who didn't meditate. The process of that integration evolved into a book that I wrote on that ever elusive goal of trying to understand the paradox of ego and interdependence within our lives. Because when you look really closely at how we make connections, everything's from a really egotistical perspective. Everything's, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's, I'm feeling the air as it touches my nose when I breathe. Everything's from this perspective of I, of this completely independently existing entity that no one can dictate except for us. But the closer you look at that, it falls apart under weight because as human beings, our very beginning, our genetic makeup, came from outside ourselves, from our parents. How that genetic makeup was expressed and continues to be expressed is largely dependent on the environmental factors beyond our control and often beyond our awareness. Even our thoughts, things that seem to be so intrinsically our own, are triggered by the people and things around us. It could even be argued that all of the energy generated in order to have that thought came from outside ourselves, from the food that we eat, and from the oxygen that those trees are exhaling. We now know that matter is composed of vibrating waves of energy, much like the sound waves that I'm using to communicate with you right now. A really interesting book that I came across called The Silent Pulse by George Leonard hinges on this idea that at the heart of each of us, there's a silent pulse of perfect rhythm, a complex of waveforms and resonances unique to us 
while still connecting us with everything else in the world. It's getting in touch with that rhythm that can transform our personal experiences. One of the studies that was talked about in The Silent Pulse remind, reminded me a lot of a YouTube video that had gone viral a couple years ago in which somebody took a bunch of little metronomes, which are those mechanical timekeepers that musicians use to keep themselves on beat, and they lined them up in neat little rows and set them off one after another. Within about two minutes, all of the metronomes synced up with each other. This phenomenon that the metronomes were doing is called entrainment, and it's the alignment of two rhythms. And it was first discovered in 1665 by a Dutch scientist named Christian Huygens. Within that book, one of the studies talked about how entrainment can be seen between two people having a conversation. Dr. William Condon of Boston University's medical school studies how we're not only in synchrony within ourselves, but if you take two people having a conversation and break everything down into 1 48th of a second increments, the listener's movements will synchronize with the speaker's voice. And so as someone speaks, that sound travels to the listener's ears, causes oscillations, which then travel to the brainstem, triggering an auditory motor reflex, which synchronizes that listener's movements with that sound of the speaker's voice. So if you look at that communication between those people under magnification, everything becomes connected. As one person talks, the listener is in sync with what they're saying while they think about what they're going to say, and everything becomes an ebb and flow of vibrations and movements back and forth. And so something that we thought we were in complete control of, our actions and reactions, becomes only partly true. Because our actions and reactions, underneath our personal consciousness, are synchronizing with anything around us that emits sound. And I would expect also anything that emits light perceived by our eyes, tastes perceived by tongues, or feelings perceived by touch. Looking for these interdependences within and around me is something that I've found gives my life meaning. Because when I'm syncing up my thinking and my experiencing with what's going on in the present, I'm actualizing the verb to live as being a present tense verb. I'm living in as true of a sense as I can. An irony that sometimes makes me smile because I'm just doing what I've always been doing, living but I'm paying attention to it. And it's just kind of funny that to do such a thing hadn't really been on my radar before. So in that same vein of looking at things in a new light, there's a really great talk I heard on the subject of ego interdependence and not discriminating between the two that I wanted to share with you. And it came from a Vietnamese Buddhist monk, peace activist, and poet named Thich Nhat Hanh in a speech that he gave to the US Congress in 2003 on the subject of hands. My right hand has written all of the poems I have composed. My left hand hasn't written any. But my right hand doesn't think, left hand, you are good for nothing. My right hand doesn't have a superiority complex. Within my two hands is a type of wisdom called the wisdom of non-discrimination. My two hands know that they are members of one body, that they are in each other. And so we can choose to look at any two people, any two things, within a context of non-discrimination if we want to, within a context of interdependence. And that choice lies within us, within our egos. As a student of osteopathic medicine, I've chosen to pursue a practice in which we're trained to not only look at how, not only look at the patient's symptoms, but how everything in their body is interrelated. We're trained not to discriminate between one part of the body and another, because we know that everything's connected by the same continuations of blood vessels, nerve cells, connective tissue, bones linked by joints, and so on. For example, I have a weak muscle in my leg, 
and along with an old knee injury, it causes my knee to tilt in. To compensate, the adjacent joints, my ankle and hip, flare out. That flared hip is then compensated for by my back, and I think that's why sometimes when I'm walking or running, I find myself rolling my shoulder back to feel more balanced. And so my point here is that there's a lot more to any issue than one isolated cause. Everything's relating and affecting everything else, whether we want it to or not, and whether we're aware of it or not. Personally, as the type A medical student that I am, being more aware of these connections makes me feel a lot better, more able to compensate to find some semblance of a balance, or at the very least, less likely to fall down. But then something also needs to be said for the interdependences that we're not going to be able to be aware of. And accepting a lack of control, a limit to our ego's conceptualization. For example, we now know that bacterial cells outnumber our own genetically unique human cells in our body 10 to 1. Something I actually heard in another TED talk. <laughs> so if you take a second to look at your hand right now, 90 to 99% of the cells in that hand aren't yours. And it's worth saying bacterial cells are much, much smaller than human cells, but that point still stands. If we can only claim 1 to 10% of the cells in our body as having our own unique genetic makeup, can we really blame somebody if they feel uncertain of their identity? In that light, maybe there's something to be said for embracing a sense of uncertainty in our lives. Because when we look at our lives underneath the microscope, it becomes a lot of different things working together. A lot of things that although are connected to us, aren't dictated by us. When we look back up from that microscope, even though we can't see those connections anymore, I think it's still worth incorporating that knowledge into our perspectives to try to look at the world through the lens of interdependence rather than singularity. And so I know I've presented a bit to you so far, but I have one more challenge. Take a second and ask yourself why we as a society might benefit from being more, more mindful of our lives and how we interact with the world. One reason, I think, is that we, as a society, have convoluted our lives into self-centered knots. Every day we isolate ourselves with emails and Facebook feeds and personal efficiency quotas. And the more we do, the more we feel like we're succeeding. But oddly enough, efficiency quotas don't make us happy. And I mean, I'll admit, I have an agenda book separated out into 15-minute intervals with a bunch of check boxes of to-do lists and things to do and meetings to attend. I know, I can be a little crazy too. But I feel lucky to have figured out for myself that a fully checked off to-do list doesn't equate to a life well lived. Because living should mean syncing up your thinking and experiencing with the present rather than the past or the future. It should mean actualizing the verb to live as a present tense verb. Because isolating ourselves within our own heads, within our own thoughts and worlds, isn't seeing the whole picture. Granted, that whole picture can be a little elusive, but to me, it's still better to look for it. For me, it's my life's driving force, trying to live in awareness, listening for the harmony that's there, neither isolating nor ignoring my ego. And so I'll end this talk as I started it with a short mindfulness practice. Close your eyes, try to clear your minds of all of those confusing um, intricacies and philosophical arguments that I just dumped on you. And try to focus only on your breath. Feel it coming in past your nose and follow where it's going.
Make a space for silence, for rest, for an allowance only on focusing on yourself existing within the world right now. <laughs> 